Mm. I think we wanted that because if you really want to be capable of delivering zero carbon solutions, and they are needed while also promoting industrial competitiveness in, in the EU economy, it is very important that you have this ambitious R&I program. And there were two key assumptions. The first one was a focus on zero carbon solutions and low carbon technologies that only reduce but do not eliminate greenhouse, greenhouse gas gases have to be used for the transition towards a carbon neutral future but have to be replaced by zero carbon ones. And the second key assumption was that zero carbon solutions shall be tackled at systems level. And for this, the role of that digitalization is of utmost importance. So in here you can see that we, we deal with that the RI program is not just a, a general program, it is it is focused on a number of issues and putting decarbonization at the heart of Horizon Europe and of other national R and I programs within the within the EU is key. Well, and I think we do have an opportunity now, as there is already also some money available, to put it mildly. I'm not going to, to walk you through the whole report, but because I would like to focus on the, um, on, the, on, the, on the labs, but I have to mention a few things before I get there. And the first one, of course, is about the energy sector, and delivering a clean, affordable and secure energy is, of course, key. Now, this, these are five of the of the of the um, of the recommendations recommendations we did we have to realize the full potential of integrating the energy system and linking the development of low carbon power markets to low carbon liquid and gas markets transportation low and high temperature heat and of course we have to pursue deep electrification of energy services for industry transport and buildings and Another thing I would like to mention here, that's about market designs. We need market designs that facilitate renewable integration, enable prosumer participation, and incentivize demand flexibility to achieve fast power sector decarbonization. But there's some other things that we have to do. We have to bring technologies for zero carbon molecules to market readiness, such as biofuels for CCS, hydrogen, and other synthetic fuels. And let's not forget about the, the development of energy storage and conversion technologies at all time scales. So we are talking about batteries, about heat storage, and of course all, also about power to X. Doing all this and implementing this energy digitalization, we need the development of an internet of energy. Now you can see we also mentioned the carbon negative technologies, and we have to be a little bit careful about that because not everything can work everywhere but we have we, it now is the time to begin investing in these so that they can scale to the levels we need them in the coming decades so although they're maybe not yet there or the technologies are there at lab scale we have to work on that now that brings me to a clean and circular industry and in the industry of course is is really a very important issue in this and we have a number of actions for the decarbonization of industry and we we focus them around around four pillars and these four pillars you can you can see here it's the carbon negative technologies energy efficiency and material savings and again again it's the deep electrification and of industrial processes and then I'm talking for instance about the electrification of industrial processes in order to make use of low carbon electricity but also hydrogen infrastructure and storage and industrial heat networks combined with multiple sources and talking about embedding industrial processes in a circular economy then you could think about circular and bio-based feedstocks in industry chemical sector sustainable plastics and waste minimization lifespan increase and recyclable materials and of course, innovation and zero carbon breakthroughs for process-based emissions industry. Think about develop, the development of disruptive technologies to decouple production from process emissions. And let's also think about industry 4.0, energy savings by improvement in process control using data analytics and censoring, etc. Another interesting issue was what we have been talking about was promoting climate neutral and smart cities. And why about smart cities? Because Cities are like a living lab where all problems come together and you really need to have a coherent and systemic approach to really make a difference in this, in this respect. And that's exactly the reason why we mentioned this harmonization of cities' climate actions across sectors through governance and urban and urban planning. Because we need R&I there to support strong governance for decarbonization in cities. 
And we all know that the re regulatory power of cities vary across Europe, but at the same time, we can, we can do something about that and scale, uh, share knowledge and scale solutions. Another important thing here is how to engage citizens in cities decarbonization strategies. Because European citizens should become an integral part of the zero carbon transition. Because if you don't do that, they will prove to be a barrier, a blockade, and I'm coming back to that later. So we understand, we need research to understand the most effective strategies for engaging citizens and how the location and size of the city can influence such strategies. And there again, it's important to do something like to do, to do this, as I, as I mentioned this before. And that brings me to the how to accelerate the shift to sustainable and smart, systems, smart transport systems. Here again, it's not only about systems we are talking, it's also about cities we are talking, and we are talking about a number of, a number of other issues. Let me just mention, I think it's, we think it's absolutely necessary to have a, a system transmission, a system transition to electromobility that we need to invest in hydrogen and electric alternatives for freight transport. And we need to find low to zero carbon options for air travel and shipping. And in that way, we could get to a situation in 2050 where we have less transport and more mobility satisfaction. And that means integrated urban zero carbon mobility and a switch from air to train and other zero carbon medium distance means of transport. And again, behavioral and demand side measures. And I come back to that every time because in our view, this human factor is something that has been forgotten many times and only we're only talking about, in, about um, research, about innovation, about policy, but we forgot about the people we are doing this for. And it's very important that they get engaged. So in this, in this case, for instance, it's also important to have research on the reconfiguration of the taxation scheme and fiscal and capital market implications as the transport sector shifts from an energy intensive towards a capital intensive market when deep decarbonization is pursued. So new policy instruments are equally important as other technology, um, technology aspects. That brings me to something which is really very important and also sometimes forgotten. It's about a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system and preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. So what we did, we have a key R&I actions for land use and, and farming. And this is something which is very important for, for Europe because we have in many parts of our, of our continent, there is a huge amount of farming we actually we farm not only for people living in our continent but we farm for others as well so the question is how long can we do that and we thought that it's important to have a drastic transformation of the way biological resources are used in production processes consumed and subsequently recycled it's necessary to comply with the paris agreement goals on climate change and for more sustainable development and land degradation and desertification are major concerns across the EU, posing an important societal challenge to Europe as beyond, as soil is a non-renewable resource. So actions to stop and reverse progressive soil degradation and ensure food security involve the implementation of transformative technologies and practices, enhancing the organic carbon accumulation in soil. And this is why we mentioned these four um, these four recommendations that we have that we have mentioned here and just to make one other comment on this um, decarbonizing European agriculture that will be a huge a huge issue because you know the vast majority of emission reduction pathways to limit global temperature rise to below these two degrees Celsius they rely on negative emissions so how to get there? And negative emissions are generally achieved through land-based strategies. Land use in Europe could be, is, could be a net sink as European forests are being replenished. So we have to work on that. And I think this is something that, shall, that should be looked, that shouldn't be, over, shouldn't be overlooked. And understanding the trade-offs between land use competition for food and energy and feedstock competition, this is something that works out differently in European countries but it works out 
also very differently in other geographies. So we have to be very careful that we, have, that we do the right things there and develop the right information, develop the right programs. And it's all about money. It's always about money. Without money, the world doesn't turn around. So we really have to work on that. And that's why we have to strengthen this data collection effort and economic models, also the economic models, because we are not only talking about, about uh, innovation and research in, uh, in climate issues, but it's also a change in, in economic model. We have to improve the modeling of labor market consequences of decarbonization and associated policies and collect data on successful low carbon business models, especially also because this is something that is very important for SMEs. Then the design of strategies to address the key barriers hindering decarbonization. And there are quite a few barriers. We have to understand them and we have to understand how to overcome these barriers, barriers linked with the deployment of zero carbon technologies. And then, yes, promote partnerships to support decarbonization. A thing there, an issue there, is how to generate interdisciplinary knowledge and expertise to support decarbonization. Find the right research partnership within the EU and internationally, and of course, design strategies to move capital at scale. Then I would like to take you to the next one, and that's a fair and inclusive energy transition. Well, when you look at today's um, developments in the debate at EU level, there's a lot been talking, there's a lot of talking about this issue, how to see to it that this transition is fair and is inclusive. And then there are Two things I would like to say. The first one is about behavior and lifestyle and social innovation. This is where citizens can really be active. These are positive, these are positive actors. And it's very important to, to, um, to promote this people support because if you don't have this people support, it will be very difficult to get, to get a, real, um, a real transition that goes really also to what the bottom is, and that is, that is human behavior. So we have to see to it that citizens take this active role in the energy transition. On the other hand, and that's the third point on this slide, we have to be realistic. Jobs will disappear. Um, in economic activity will disappear. People will not be able to use their old competences, but they, they need to be retrained. So leaving no one and no region behind also means that you have to look and you have to put research and innovation to monitor and countervailing these possible adverse impacts for groups or regions that might occur. And I can tell you, it's not, it might occur, it will occur. We have to, we have to be very, very clear about that. And this third thing is also about emotions, it's also about feelings. Now, the big question is, is it possible to use the money of the transition fund as meaningful as possible and then this is one of the things I would like to mention as well. And that brings me quite naturally to my last point, and that is the transition of super labs. The point is that the urgency and the complexity of the challenge, however, requires a further instrument. And we defined it here as a real life laboratory where systemic innovation for the transition to a fully decarbonized economy is tested at scale and locations where particularly difficult transition efforts will be required. So this again is this holistic and systemic approach. And you know, what are we talking about? There are a number of European regions that could be, will be negatively impacted. Those who are, have an economy dependent on fossil fuels. For instance, mining industrial complexes and they that need to be transformed quickly without destroying their value creation potential. What about intensive agricultural areas? Conventional agricultural regions that are suitable for conversion into climate neutral, negative bioeconomies can also become havens for biodiversity and sustainable tourism. Cities with inefficient building stock. Well, we all know our metropolitan areas where novel concepts of mobility, construction and operation can be combined, and most notably by making use of the powerful tools provided by digitalization and artificial intelligence. And then again, we have to bring all stakeholders together, it's representatives of research, business, administration, civil society, and they jointly research, plan, and implement measures for the transition. Because this will come, this will lead to a systemic solution, systemic solution and approach. 
And yes, that you need money, but mixed money from European to transition fund, for instance, other funds in Horizon 2020, by national, regional and private funds. And I would like to mention here as well, let's learn from the past. What I mean with that, in the 80s and the 70s, the 70s of the last century, we had something which was called the European Fund for Regional Development. It was a lot of money and it went, for instance, to old mining districts. I'm coming from an old mining district, the only mining district, coal mining district in the Netherlands. And we decided, the government decided to close down all coal mines in 69, 1969. So we had to transition from mining to new economic value. We had to transition from a really mining-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. And that's what we did. We did retraining. We did a new focus on services, tourism, health, IT. We used this like a, what we call a triple helix, where we brought together policymakers, research and uh, knowledge institutions and, and, and industry. The important thing is that it was a joint approach and we used the money from the regional fund for European Fund for Regional Development. It was a success. It was a success in other parts in Europe and it was a disaster in some of the parts in Europe I'm not going to mention here because, well, we know now they are still in problems and they will need to really go through this kind of transition. Now, Transition superlabs, could they be helpful? I think they could. And here you can find a number of the issues that I was just have just been mentioned, uh, talking about. And it's important that you do it together, that you monitor the transition in a broad sense, and that you make clear also to others why it is successful, what the success factors are, and how you can see to it that it's really going to work. You can do it in different EU regions, but you have to define before that you have to define the criteria because if the money goes everywhere it's not going to be very helpful these regions will have a different focus that will of course depend on the local context but you have to use a common methodology otherwise you can't compare together you then have your european network of transition superlabs and of course a european transition observatory of local transformations that generates lessons learned is able to countervail these adverse impacts and provides feedback. You need to develop a kind of governance model to do this. And it's very important that in the regions that will be chosen, you have somebody or a group that is really the first responsible group to do that, to bring these people together. And we think there also might be a role for Climate Kick, so the Climate Knowledge Innovation Center of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, as a kind of new creation element. But the most important thing is that you choose for a regional approach that the criteria are clear from the very beginning and that the all stakeholders are brought together and that the money not only comes from Europe, also comes from national, regional funds and from industry, from private parties. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Maria. Um, uh, we have a question from um, Jeremy, um, Jeremy Millard. Uh, I'm not sure, can you see it? <laughs> no, okay, so I'll read it out. Um, what is the role of tech innovations in food systems? For example, vertical and precision farming, 3D food printing, etc., whilst rewilding much of our countryside, i.e. reducing aerial coverage of food, food productive, you mentioned a triple helix, but now we need a quadruple helix and even quintup quintuple <laughs> helix. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. well, well, first, the last question. We used a triple helix, but I'm quite aware that that was in the past. So it's important to find, to define the new helix. And whether it's quadruple or what the difficult word is quintuple, I don't mind. But it's important to bring the stakeholders, the relevant stakeholders together. That's the most important issue. And what has been done in the Netherlands in the past, it was the word of three. That's why tri triple. But I can fully imagine that given the situation now, there, there, it, there can be more. Now, I lost the other question. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, wait, we're, trying, we're trying to get it back? No. Well... Let me, let me put it like, yes, it was about, about all other kinds of uh, food production. Yes, we discussed that. 
And uh, I only mentioned just a few of the recommendations, but you are quite right. It's also about 3D printing. And I can see now that in some parts in, well, I only have a Dutch experience, so let me put it there. 3D printing for food is, is something that is really coming, to, coming, coming to, to, to the front. And it's important to close your eyes. No, it's important not to close your eyes for any new developments. Why do I say this? Because this report is 2018, it's now 2020. And in the meantime, other things have already, have already been brought to, to our knowledge. So don't stop looking for new and better solutions and use the solutions you have. You mentioned also this vertical farm. Yes, also, that was also farming, or we looked into that as well. And also in the other things we, uh, you mentioned, but I didn't mention them in my presentation now, but that's only because of time limits. Um, now, how do I attempt, how do you attempt to include EU citizens in the process considering the growing distrust in the EU? Wow, that is a really, really fundamental question. I can tell you only, only one thing. Don't try to do it at a European level. It's not going to work. You have to do it at the regional level because in, it's in the region where this transformation is going to take place. You're talking about the number of layers. And of course, from the top layer, the EU layer, you have to decide whether you're going to do this or not, how you're going to finance it and how are you going to let it organized and how are you going to monitor it. But then see to it that in the region, you, the relevant stakeholders are being brought together and that people realize that although they are going to lose something, because that's what's going to happen, there are answers. And the, answers can, the answer cannot be, oh, well, but there will be thousands of new jobs in wind industry. Then they look at you and say, yeah, well, maybe in some part of Europe, but not in my part. So you have to find solutions. You have to, 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 to find solutions that are really important for that region where you have to plan, where you're going to plan that super lab. And this is something that otherwise is not going to work. Now, the, how will IoT develop in energy? In energy well, develop? How will Internet of Things development energy be supported? And also, will there be an effort to create a repository of energy data that could be used for all of that? This is, this is a very interesting one. I'll tell you why. I think it's very important that there is an, that all this kind of data that are really necessary, that they are being brought together in, a, um, in, an, independent, in an independent system. If you really want to go to... Um, to understand interactions, you have to provide open databases with highly detailed information on all aspects of the EU energy system. That's, that's my point. And this integrated system modeling needs to capture all energy system interactions and environmental effects. So that will bring you to a full capture of behavioral aspects and economic and innovation effects. And I think this is something where the Internet of Things can be, can be very helpful. On the other hand, if you really want to, to integrate all renewables into a system with a sufficient, sufficient storage, intermediate and seasonal, we cannot do without the Internet of Things. How do, oh, oh, wait a minute. How, what will the European Transition Observatory Network do in addition to the current platforms and EU initiatives, e.g. co-regions in transition platform? Add, what's the added value of it? Yeah. I think that's 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 an interesting question as well, um, because maybe you should look at why the existing existing instruments work or don't work, and then you can start from there, because some um, although you when you are going to work when we are going to work on this uh, international in, into this um, uh, transition superlapse. Um, we cannot have the, um, the idea that it will be the same everywhere. It's not one size fits all. And uh, where existing models can be helpful, use them. And don't put something new in place where you don't need to, to, where you don't need to, uh, to do that. So if there's no need to fix it, don't fix it and let it be. Uh, biofuels will still play a significant part in significant role in the process of decarbonization of the EU in the next few years. Um, I'm not a hundred percent convinced. I think there will certainly be a role for biofuels, absolutely. But how large that role will be is dependent on how 
the um, regu regulatory uh, issues around biofuels will be solved. There is also still this, this, this well, um, battle between um, food for fuel and food for food. So this is something that also cannot be solved just in one way and certainly not at a global level. You have to, I think there needs a lot more of uh, research and innovation being done on what the consequences are of this biofuel and not only for the energy system but also for other aspects of the uh, of the of the global life where do you think bezos what's bezos um it's that jeff bezos the um the owner of amazon has just announced a 10 oh, billion <laughs> earth fund i i think that's right and i hope, I hope it's the same base also i wonder if there's two that have 10 billion uh, well the first thing i think we have to get them if you don't get them you can't spend them and the second thing what i am a little bit worried about is that all these um these huge these, these huge organizations they they are really eating up a lot of energy. How are we going to see to it that that is not going to be a problem in the, in, the, in the coming years? So this is something that, in my view, needs to be looked into as well. And then here we have two questions. The different one and two different questions. Yeah. What do you see as the most urgent EU policy steps needed to reduce well, I don't know what emissions in the building sector? The, the solutions in the building sector, of course, you can have EU programs on that, but split incentives are, of course, a, a huge problem in the building sector where those who are going to profit from the, uh, from the energies, energy efficiency measures are not the same people as those who are going to, uh, to, to, pay, to pay the rent. So these kind of split incentives have to have really to be, to, be, to, be, to be solved in some way, in some way or the other. Um, and question. synthetic fuels in... Uh, yeah. Synthetic fuels could be used to replace fossil fuels in aviation and indeed sea shipping. Yeah. But their manufacturing involves many steps with efficiency That's losses. Right? When do you expect synthetic fuels to become competitive in EU market and what needs to be done to achieve that? Well, you know, dear William, if I would have a glass, a glass bowl and a magic wand, I could give you a straightaway answer, but I can't. But I don't have them, so I can't. But what I do know that is that I see a progress in these synthetic fuels. They are, it's coming from lab scale to, to pilot scale and further for, and, and goes up. And here again, it is, I know it takes some time, but if you don't work on it now, it will never be there. So there again, I think there is a lot of, a lot of um, uh, necessity to have a further research and innovation in this respect, especially also innovation, not only research, but we have to make the step from research to innovation and then to e an economic model because that's the that's the whole chain no don't stop at innovation this is a yeah. central strategy there is a mechanism to monitor and control rebounds in fact and uh, driven paradox well there is some mechanism but it's not um, as far as i know the mechanisms being used are not always comparable and so I think it's here again, it's important to have um, data that can really be comparable. So data on the effects of these measures that, can, that are really comparable. What we now can see is that what's happening in the Netherlands is not happening in France, and definitely not in Paris, and also not in some other parts of Europe. So if you don't have uh, information data that can be compared, you don't, you don't really know what the result of it is. So, and you can't control the rebounds. So this is something I would we would certainly advise to put a lot of inf to put a lot of, of research in, to, into. Okay, um, I, I would say maybe we have time for one more question, and then we could run the two polling questions that we have afterwards. Uh, how can we implement green building policy while many buildings, for example, in France, are old enough? And there are lots of restrictions. No, I, I, I don't think that, that I'm going to take that question because the answer to that one is a little bit as uh, the same as the answer I already gave. Let's take another one. Um, yeah. 
How can we achieve good research process about zero emissions when engineers dominate the research? Social science is often only given a limited or token role. Dear Ruth, thank you for that question because that's exactly the point I wanted to make. Don't put innovation only in the hands of engineers or politicians, but see to it that you involve people and involve the societal aspects of this kind of innovation. Thank you very much for your question. Okay, so now there should be a window that has popped up for you all. Um, and it's, the question is, and we'd like you all to vote, um, to what extent do you agree that the EU should focus um, the EU regions with an economic dependent ec uh, economy? Sorry, let me just, yeah, okay. <laughs> And and as you all come to the end of that question, I would ask that we get started with our next presentation up on the screen. So George, if you could share your screen now. And now we'll go to the second question. Um, do you agree that the following EU sector should be at the focus of establishing transition super labs? Please select all the answers that apply to you. So you're able to vote more than once on this one. Okay, great. Now we should have George up next with his presentation. Ah, okay. So we seem to be having, um, Rosa, could you um, stop the share? Ah, okay. Yeah, now it should work. Sorry about that. So hello also for me. Um, I hope you can all see my screen now. If uh, Samindra, can you confirm? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry for this technical issue. Uh, hello also for me. Um, if I can, um, yeah, I will go ahead and start the presentation. So uh, my name is Giorgio Seksakis and I'm a PhD candidate at uh, the University of Geneva in the Renewable Energy Systems Group. Uh, we'll be, we were part of the DITS project and uh, uh, together with Professor Avelina Trutnevite, we developed this survey uh, in order to uh, validate main messages of the high-level panel report, so like what you heard already from Maria before, uh, with different stakeholders and uh, collect feedback on additional uh, things that could be important for the research and innovation for decarbonization. So uh, for the next uh, around 20 minutes, I'm going to um, guide you through the results of the survey. So these are the contents of this presentation. I'm going to say some things about uh, how we designed this survey, what was the sample that we had, and uh, move to key findings, survey insights, and how these are connected with future DITS uh, uh, activities.
Uh, the service structure is, was uh, uh, quite, we kept it quite straightforward. So initially we had questions on the professional background of the respondents in order to know uh, which, from which sector they're answering, uh, what was their uh, background, their fields that they were more experienced in and also where they were from, from uh, different member states in the EU. Uh, then we had a small introduction to the high level panel report. Um, uh, as we assume that some of our respondents might not be um, might not be might not have read the whole report yet at the time we did the survey, and uh, then we had questions to validate the key messages. So um, we also kept the structure that was uh, kind of like introducing the respondents to the to the report. So we asked them first about overall priorities uh, for decarbonization. So the main directions that were given by the high-level panel report uh, in order to uh, build the rest of the priorities for the research and innovation. Uh, then we asked about uh, transition super labs, um, what you have heard also from Maria before, some ideas about these labs. And then we uh, dive into more details and we asked about the specific priorities. So. Uh, Maria gave you a bit, uh, a small, uh, let's say, taste of them, but they are actually the report is quite rich in priorities. There are around 81 uh, specific uh, research and innovation priorities for uh, seven sectors and thematic areas. Um, so afterwards, all these three uh, results, uh, through all these three sections of questions, we had also open-ended questions in order to gather comments and suggestions from the respondents. Um, in uh, this was one part, one activity from the DITS project to collect uh, data on this aspect. There were also workshops, but for in this survey, we uh, chose to to ask for every section, uh, to ask for all in detail for all the, the research and innovation um, uh, priorities that were given in the report, and then the workshops were able to uh, analyze further. Uh, and discuss it with stakeholders in more detail. A um, few words about the dissemination of the survey. Um, it was, uh, the survey duration was uh, around three and a half months. It was launched in March, 2019, and it was until June, the end of June. Um, our strategy uh, was uh, to send email invitations with uh, survey to uh, the expert database and the stakeholder network that was developed by DEETS before. And then also use mailing lists, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn uh, from DEETS project and also consortium partners and also other organizations. So we send invitations to Climate Action Network, Euroactive, etc. We also use an access panel in Germany, France, UK, and Italy to add some more participants. Uh, in total, we had uh, 1,676 individuals clicking on the link, and from them, 189 completed at least one question, and 152 completed the full survey. Um, some uh, more details about our samples. So most of our sample, more than 40% came from academia or research organizations, uh, while another 25% came from business or industry and the rest from non-governmental organizations and public organizations. Um, from the field background uh, of our participants, most of them, they, uh, they were experienced in the energy and power sector. Yeah, I'll just put laser pointer here, help you a bit more. So these were all the sectors that were given in the high level panel report. So we wanted to see uh, what was the background of, the, um, of our respondents in relation with, this, uh, with these sectors. Most of them came uh, from energy and power, then social innovation and lifestyles, uh, transportation and mobility, and very few from agriculture and land use. So as you see, there is, um, the representation was a bit skewed towards energy and, uh, uh, and, uh, and academics uh, here. Um, looking at the geographical uh, distribution of our sample, we see that most of our respondents came from Germany. Uh, UK, um, then France and Italy, but uh, there were at least some uh, respondents uh, coming from uh, each member state. Uh, 
And then on the right, you see here the results of a question that we asked to respondents if they knew of the high level panel report before. Um, almost half of them knew about it, but only a small uh, percentage have read it by then. So it was around three months uh, that was the report was out. So it was also not that uh, it was a bit still a bit fresh. Uh, um, so our approach to to inform them as well as ask for the feedback in the survey was um, uh, was helpful. It was helpful in the end. Um, so moving forward to the results. So this is the first section of the results. So as I said, we, uh, in order not to, uh, to introduce uh, the main directions of, of the high level panel report for the research and innovation, we asked our participants to, um, to evaluate these uh, five big priorities that were given by high level panel report. So you see them here on the right. Uh, there are two for short-term priorities for 2025, uh, a medium-term priority for 2035, and two long-term priorities for 2050. Um, I'm not going to detail on reading them, but um, if you have a fast look and then you'll see they are um, they're quite high level, they're quite broad, uh, but they are the basis of creating the, um, the uh, priorities, the more, um, specific priorities uh, um, that are given in the reports. So for these directions, uh, most respondents supported them. So we have a support rate of around 71% to 83% for these uh, uh, broad level directions. So with the blue, you can see here, dark blue, the, strong, the people that strongly agreed with this, uh, and uh, with light blue, the people that agreed, and very few disagreements uh, as well. Of course, this was expected, like it, it in a sense, these directions that go to directions that were already existing in Europe, uh, in a sense. Uh, so we wanted to see, to give some more concrete examples of, of, um, of these kind of uh, research and innovation priorities from the report. So after each of these uh, broad directions, we also asked about specific, some specific examples. And then, of course, the support rates uh, varied a bit more, uh, but not that much. Like for most priorities, the share of support was above 70%. So above 70% of our participants believe that it was, it was a good idea or a very good idea to uh, prioritize these, uh, these uh, research innovation actions. Uh, here on the right, I give you the ones that receive the lowest support, and these are related with uh, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and public-private partnerships. Uh, of course, here is some of them, uh, for public-private partnerships, uh, there's not that much detail, but there is quite a lot of detailed plan how to do this in the high-level panel report. Um, but our respondents thought that as an idea would not they will not support it as much as the as the other priorities. Um, as you see, though, uh, even these ones that receive the lowest priority, they are still uh, well supported by our, our our respondents. So it's not that it's not that people they don't like it. It's mostly that they like it less, let's say, than the rest of the priorities. Um, so in total, we could say that people more or less agreed that uh, what was given in the high-level panel report was uh, important to prioritize here. Um, then we asked our participants for inputs, like uh, things that were missed, uh, other ideas for research and innovation for Europe, uh, for decarbonization. Here you can see some of the most recurring uh, suggestions. So uh, a lot of respondents uh, stressed the international cooperation measures so that's not uh, it's not only a country issue it's not only a europe's issue that should be more technological cooperation understanding geopolitical and resource access challenges promoting trade-eu cooperation standardization and some of these aspects should also appear in the plans for the research and innovation for the organization for europe um, although the high level panel report had uh, a quite um, detailed system level strategy on how to uh, to to create the research and innovation plans uh, participants responded to our survey said that this is even more needed uh, and even more integration is needed here 
and um, technology wise uh, there was also a bit uh, you could say of a debate like some respondents uh, suggested that the priority should lie in the electrification of non-power sectors while others uh, thought that mostly it's fuel and domestic heating decarbonization that should be the priority um, of course, as also Maria said before, it's not only about technology and uh, a lot of our respondents said that. So our respondents uh, believe that behavior change or measures to reduce energy demand like local buying or, um, or remote working, they are equally important. Uh, while also there should be um, some attention on public communication for the transition. So moving on to the second section of the results. So here we asked about the transition superlabs. Um, Maria already showed you some, some ideas that were in the, in the uh, high level panel report. So here are these uh, ideas that were in the report and we asked our, our, um, our respondents to evaluate them. Uh, so as you can see, uh, for most of them, we have also quite supportive uh, uh, answer from our, from our respondents. So most of them, they are agreeing or strongly agreeing with them. Uh, and so also to, 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 to remind you a bit, these are areas that could be impacted uh, negatively by the transition. So the idea is uh, to have transition super labs there also to ameliorate the, 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 the impacts uh, for many other factors, but also to act as a flagship, uh, as flagship demonstrators of for the transition. So to show that it's possible even in the, in the, in the most difficult areas, in a sense. Um, we also ask our respondents to where these super labs could be built, where are areas like these that could be, um, that it would be interesting to build uh, super labs there. And the respondents uh, said that they could be built in Germany, France, Poland, Spain, and the UK, mostly. Um, we also asked our uh, respondents to suggest additional themes, and some respondents came up with ideas uh, in the transport sector. So for uh, areas that they act as transfer hubs, uh, as transportation hubs, to uh, create super labs in order to convert them into zero emission transfer hubs for both cargo and passengers. Um, other uh, respondents suggested that tourism industry could be interesting, like uh, areas with a lot of hotel resorts, uh, that their uh, energy and emission intensive could be uh, places that uh, transition super labs could be placed. Uh, others stressed uh, uh, the idea that these super labs should be in left behind areas like uh, brownfields, like old industrial areas, rural areas, islands, uh, while other respondents suggested that uh, these super labs could be also in a more local scale. So for example, they could be also uh, created in neighborhoods. Uh, and finally, some people suggested that uh, they could be also in the form of energy communities in areas, especially with low diffusion of renewable energy, uh, for example, in Poland. So now we're moving to the third um, uh, to the third part of our uh, of our results. So here you can see um, here we, we wanted to get into more details, as I said, and ask our respondents for all the priorities that we were given in the high level panel report. Uh, of course, given that they're Quite many. There are around 81. Like they are not. It not be, it would be very time consuming to ask all our respondents to give feedback for all of them. So we asked the respondents to choose which sector they feel uh, more comfortable with uh, with evaluating these uh, these priorities. Um, as you expect, most of them they chose energy and power sector because they they had this background. Uh, industry and transportation and mobility came next. Um, while the rest of the sectors receive uh, less feedback, less than 20, um, le from less than 20 respondents each. So some results here uh, should be taken, as we say, like with a pinch of salt, uh, but that's why we also uh, use the, the possibility of before, like we are asking the overall, about the overall priorities in section one of the results that I show you, to ask about some examples in order to get the full uh, the feedback from the whole sample there. 
Um, so moving forward, these are the results for the whole energy system. So the high level panel had uh, um, three main, uh, main priorities that you can see on the left here about the whole energy systems. And here we also, on the top part of the figure, you can see the questions we asked our, our partner, our, our respondents. So um, the intention here was not only to ask, do you agree to prioritize this action or not, but also make a small